This is the last lecture of the class Symmetry, Structure, and Tensor Properties of Materials. And in this last lecture, we will talk about elastic moduli. Um, at the end of lecture 88, I mentioned that uh, this is an important discussion because um, in 88, it's pretty obvious that, well, if I stick to compliance and stiffness matrices, I should be able to, um, I, I, I should be fine. Right now, what we've done is we've created different elastic moduli to help us out, and sometimes sometimes people aren't clear on where they got the the moduli from and how they're based on the CIJKL. So I want to go through that a little bit uh, before we end. So I have an element attached to the to this base here, and I hang a weight. And what it does is in the x1 direction it creates stress and that's it I don't have stress anywhere else and this thing is length L so um, if I were to write this in usual Hooke's law I would start having to worry about C11 epsilon 1 plus c12 epsilon 2 plus and you realize wow you know uh, that's pretty complicated and this is a perfect example where you'd actually want to use compliance because it's pretty straightforward I could say and that's it I'm done and the reason is that I'm applying Sigma in one direction and I can look at epsilon 1 pretty directly. And there's no complication, complication right? Now, it turns out that um, that is not typically what's done. If you look, a lot, of the, um, a lot of the elastic constants are really expressed in CIJKL and Hooke's Law, which in a general form we showed last time. Um, is the main way people express um, all of the stress strain relationships stiffness is not used as much uh, sorry um, compliance is not used as much as stiffness this is the more common uh, version but i want to show you is that all this gets very confusing when you do move to uh, simple expressions because what people do is they say aha you know i would like to have a simple relationship like this but I like to express it in terms of sigma and so what I'll do is I'll typically say aha I want an expression like this where under uniaxial stress I'll create a modulus here and it's called Young's modulus and it's meant to be useful because uh, basically uh, it's just saying experimentally I am going to look at sigma and and epsilon and instead of having to deal with the complexity here I'll just put a y here and um, you know it'll be very similar to this one over here where if I had done it in terms of compliance I'd have a direct relationships now the problem with this th then people continue to do this they introduce a Poisson's ratio uh, also in, in this work uh, that is a combination of elastic constants as well. So this is how you get the plethora of modulus and then we have the shear modulus that's written as G, right? So what I want to do here is just review how these are all derived under very specific cases and that you're basically always better off going to back to the basic phenomena and that you better be careful if you use a reduced modulus like this you better know where it came from and I'm going to give you the example of a simple uniaxial case which everyone understands but since we're not using compliances and we're using stiffness we'll have to go through these types of equations I want to show you exactly where Young's modulus comes from and then show you that for example under biaxial stress you shouldn't be using Young's modulus now what people have done is they've realized that and then they express the biaxial modulus 
in terms of Young's modulus and Poisson ratio, which is even more confusing because you're using moduli that are inherently related to uh, uniaxial experiment. And, and my preference is that any time that you're not in this case, you should actually go back to the CIJKL. But uh, unfortunately, research and uh, publications, people generally uh, don't do that. It's a very, very common mistake. So let me um, start with uh, um, taking you back to the uh, very simple case of uh, this, what you're seeing here on the left hand. And remember, uh, if I think about it in terms of stiffness, which is this top expression, uh, if I keep this coordinate system, remember what's happening, sigma 1 is sigma but sigma 2 is 0 and sigma 3 is 0. So just remember that I am pulling an, a force on this area here creating a stress and um, uh, there is strain that occurs in all directions, right? So I have a full you know, strain matrix, but in terms of stress, the thing I'm applying, I'm only applying in one direction. So we can use that to our advantage when we determine what these moduli are. So let's write this out, that it's uniaxial cubic material and no plastic deformation. So already you should keep these simplifications in mind. And therefore I can write those expressions. And I'm going to use the reduced notation because um, this is an example how I'm staying within the same coordinate system as to where these things are defined. And I see no need to rotate out of it right now. I give you the example before about how you know, if I had defects that predominantly lie in, in one direction, not aligned to the cubic axis, as an example of a problem, because then I have to deal with plastic deformation, how the how they change the stress and how to get them into the same coordinate system. But um, you know, remember that sigma two equals zero, and remember there's only three elastic constants I need to worry about, and with this uniaxial stress, I'm only worrying about under these conditions. I don't need to worry about the um, two of them, right? So I only need to worry about C11. The diagonal components are all C11, and everything else is C12, right? This should actually be C12. Now, the first thing you notice is, well, I can set these two to equal to each other. And very quickly, uh, you arrive at uh, the following that, okay? And what that means is the classic thing we all know intuitively, that in the other two directions, the strain has to be the same. And so what we're going to do is we're going to define the strains that come in on the sides, because remember how we had our, so we're going to call this one epsilon parallel. And then since they're the same, this is going to be epsilon perpendicular, right? So the two and the three are both equal to the same, but two and the three are the same. We're going to call that because it's perpendicular to the direction of this applied stress. And then we're going to call epsilon 1 just epsilon parallel because it's aligned to uh, the stress direction. OK? So now I'm going to go back. I'm going to clear this page. I just want to tell you what I'm going to do before I go back. So now I'm going to go back. I'm going to make these substitutions, first of all, into you know this expression up here, right? Uh, and one of these expressions, let's say the second one, what the second one is going to produce just by itself, because the minute that I substitute in these, I can actually solve for 
E parallel in terms of E perpendicular, just with this middle expression here, for example. I could use either one, but I'm using the middle one. And that's going to give me uh, Poisson's ratio in terms of C's, right? And then uh, once I have the relationship between E parallel and E perpendicular, I can come back and substitute in here and solve with the sigma that I have. And that'll give me Young's modulus, which again, are all under the unique case of uniaxial stress. So let's do that. Oh, epsilon perpendicular. This immediately reduces to epsilon perpendicular equals a minus C12 over C11 plus C12 epsilon parallel. So you guys may recognize that this means E perpendicular equals a minus nu epsilon parallel. And so that's the classic case that when I have a uniaxial stress experiment and I pull down here, this will stretch inwards. And that's what the minus sign shows, that whatever strain is created here in parallel, I end up with a contraction. Or in the other case, if I actually push with the opposite thing, then it'll expand, right? So it's a minus nu. And so nu here under uniaxial condition is defined. Now I could keep this definition forever, even when I'm not in the uni uniaxial case. And that's what people do. And it's extremely confusing. Uh, to students or people practicing in the field early on. So very, very important to realize that this is created under the uniaxial system of stress. But if you, you can always keep this, it's just a definition, right? It's just a definition. So you can always keep new, even when you're talking about other strain states, but it's very dangerous. So let's do the last one, which is, you know, I've got Poisson's defi defined now. That's a a particular kind of moduli, right? Or it's a ratio, but it involves C11 and C12. And let's do the uh, the final one now, which is I can insert into the first equation with my previous expressions of E parallel. And then the last two expressions become simply C12 epsilon perpendicular. Now that I have epsilon perpendicular, uh, I can substitute in uh, E parallel in here because it defined the relationship between the two, but I won't use nu. I'm going to use all C's still so I can keep that all in terms of C's first. And now I'll make the substitution. So now I have a relationship where I can describe Young's modulus, which is the proportionality between epsilon parallel and sigma 1 in the uniaxial expression. So I hope you can see that both y, for example, and nu are defined by the uniaxial case. Now, I've defined them in terms of C11 and C12, and so I can always use them just as randomly saying that. What people get confused by is on the biaxial stress, for example, they want to say sigma 1 is going to equal y uh, epsilon 1. And this is actually under biaxial stress, for example, under the same conditions, except for the stress part. And of course, this is not true that actually if you resolve those equations you would have to now solve them with let's say they're equal in both directions which is another simplification but you could have both those sigmas you know and then sigma you know 3 equals 0 and then you could solve this and you'd find out that y would be different in that case and so uh, the moduli themselves would change you cannot take a uniaxial mod. Now, it turns out you could put something in here 
which uh, then is composed of things like y and nu, for example. But all you're doing is manipulating it so that you can have the proper, you know, CIJKL combination in here under the biaxial case. So it is my recommendation that you should use the CIJKL whenever you're doing fundamental work at this level. And that's the end of our class. I hope that you've enjoyed moving from pure geometrical symmetry arguments about objects and uh, how symmetry elements can only be combined in so many ways in three-dimensional space. And then we've created uh, a set of point groups in 2D, plane groups in 2D, uh, then gone to three-dimensional point groups, space groups, uh, then finally adding atoms. We used ionic crystals because it's easier to, to do with the um, billiard ball models, but doing so allows us to uh, think about things like Pauling's rules, which tell us how now that we have particular symmetries in the crystals and the points that we would occupy with atoms uh, in those uh, uh, symmetries have certain coordination. And we connected that coordination to just fundamental geometry for the hardball model of ions and showed, okay, if I need fourfold coordination and sixfold coordination, you know, here's the kind of uh, crystal symmetries that actually have those points that can occupy uh, such coordination. And then finally, after having added atoms, we then said, okay, uh, we know from symmetry that, uh, you know, these crystals have uh, symmetry elements in all different directions. And therefore, we're going to need to model properties with tensors. And finally, after um, going through how we can have notation for tensors, we then applied it and then showed how symmetries can eliminate a lot of the elements in pro property tensors uh, that um, uh, we don't need to worry about because symmetry demands that the properties are invariant under those symmetry elements. And finally, we just uh, mentioned uh, examples of uh, uh, second rank, third rank, and fourth rank tensors, which hopefully will allow you now to picture this world that we have derived completely independently from other lenses that are typically used to build up solids. And hopefully that you'll find that useful in whatever endeavors you take, or at least intellectually satisfying that we can build a world based on symmetry and uh, simple models of atoms and materials properties.